evening. Pauline just said to me before, she says, don't worry about the time. Because our church finishes at seven, so. Uh, well, not that quick. Not that quick. But she didn't, she didn't say, you know, she didn't say, you know, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. Um, our reading tonight it is really on the same theme of our last song. And it's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. So um, it's on the screen. Oh, there it is. That's good. It's uh, Paul's letter to Timothy. So these are the words of Paul uh, to Timothy. And he says this in verse 3. I thank God, whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Venus. And I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life. And, be- and not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Shall we just have a moment of prayer? Father, we do thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the promises we find in your word. The wonderful words of life. Lord, sometimes we confess we find it hard to comprehend what you try to say to us. Sometimes the things you, you tell us are too big for us to take hold of. But we pray that your Holy Spirit tonight might help us to understand what you want us to know. Father, we pray for the youngsters who have just left us. May they have a very precious time in your other room as they learn about Jesus. And may they be blessed just as we pray that we be blessed as we think on your word and we open ourselves to your, your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. When I was a young Christian, um, the church I, I go to still, the same church really, Risley, a lot of people came to speak at our church, and, and they would speak from the text, and they would have a Bible reading, and then they would take one verse from the reading and say, today's text is this verse, and spend the next 20 odd minutes talking about that particular verse. And it's a style of speaking that I don't hear or see much these days. Uh, but tonight, there is one verse which we're going to think about mainly. And it is, I suppose, our text for, t- for tonight. It is 2 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 7. And if nothing else sticks in our minds tonight, <coughs> but from what we're going to share about, <coughs> mending this verse is perhaps the most important thing. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. It's one of those verses that has followed me around many years. It's, in, it's intrigued me because it challenges me, first of all. It also excites me as well because it, it promises a quality of life that I have experienced in part, but not completely. And it tells me that God has got so much more for us. So very much more than we have yet experienced. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul says this. He says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power 
that is at work within us, to him be glory. The God who can do in us immeasurably more than what we ask or even imagine. It's as if we've hardly scratched the surface of what God might do in our lives. The potential we have in God is truly amazing. And I'd like us to think about that for tonight. So we're going to think about the sort of life that we might have in Christ and the sort of people that we might be in Christ as well. And you know, from the verses we read in Timothy, it all starts off with a gift from God. We read in our verse, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit. God has given us a spirit. God has given us his spirit, his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit changes everything about our lives. And if I ask you the question tonight, what's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? You probably have lots of different answers, and they'd all be relevant, and they'd all be, be valid and useful. But the very quickest answer is the Holy Spirit. He makes the difference. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And when a person becomes a Christian, it's not just a new start, but it's a transformation. There's a change that takes place within, which is, we could say, a fundamental change. Because from that moment onwards, God's Spirit lives within. And He makes the difference. The Holy Spirit, we don't deserve Him, we can't earn Him, and we don't learn it, but he is God's gift to us by grace. And it's not that he will be given to us, or that he should be, or he might be, or that he's being given to us, but as it says here, he has been given. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit. If we are in Christ, God has given us his spirit. The potential we have in God is already planted within us. As the word of God tells us, it is God living in us by his spirit. Paul puts it this way, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's an incredible thought. That Christ lives within us by his spirit. Something to ponder and to meditate upon and to delight in. The potential we have in God is because God lives within us. And because he lives within us then, there's no limit to what God might do in us and through us. As Paul writes to Timothy, he gives him this tremendous verse to think about, this tremendous word, and he begins to explain to Timothy the effect the Holy Spirit has upon us. But first of all, he tells us the effect the Holy Spirit doesn't have. Because he says to Timothy, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity. The word timidity here is a Greek word called diarrhea. And this word, it means fearfulness or even cowardice. And it's always used in a negative sense. We know that some forms of fear are good and right. Fear the Lord is a healthy fear. It is a right attitude towards our Creator God. That's a different word. But this word, it means fearfulness. Timidity, it means, it means something which is bad. It's never a good reaction. In the scriptures, we read about it, and it says in the scriptures that it can't live alongside faith, and it can't live alongside love, and it can't live alongside peace. It goes against those things. And in my own life, fear, I know fear is a terrible thing, I've experienced it at times. And it takes away our joy, it takes away our hope, it can paralyze us. You've never been paralyzed by fear. You're so frightened you can't move or do anything. I've been like that occasionally as well. Fear robs us of our God given opportunities. Uh, and in a sense, fear brings the death of all that is good inside of us. And if we have fear in our hearts tonight, that sort of unhealthy fear, then we can be sure that God didn't put it there. And God does not. God did not give us a spirit of timidity. 
And if we have real feelings like that in our lives, the Lord wants to take He really does. And I would suggest that you share with someone, you pray with someone, let God deal with that in your life. He wants you to be free of that sort of thing. He did not give us a spirit of timidity. Not at all. But he has given us a spirit, and this spirit, his spirit, is a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. We're going to look at those three qualities a little more closely. But just a couple of thoughts about those qualities. First of all, these qualities, they are inclusive and not exclusive. But what I mean is, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. Not all self-discipline. It's not that God's going to say, I'm going to develop power in you over there, or I'm going to give you um, love, and I'm going to give you self-discipline. It's not a case of one or the other. The Lord wants to develop all those qualities in all of God's people. It's not just for ministers and evangelists, elders, people who who do great things for the Lord, People who, who, who plant churches and all these amazing things. It's for all of us, all of God's people. God has given us a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And also, these qualities, they are complementary and not contradictory. Because those three qualities, on the face of it, are quite different. Power, love, and self-discipline, that they, they seem totally Related, but in fact they complement each other perfectly. Imagine a person who has power, but has no love and no self-discipline. The rest is a disaster. And somebody who has love, but they have no power and no self-discipline, then that love can become weak and become misdirected. Somebody who has self-discipline but no power and no love, well, that is legalism. That is living by a rule book, that's lifeless, that's lie. We need all of those qualities in our lives if we are to live right to the full. We know that Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He wants us to have his love, his power, his self-discipline in our lives. And they come into our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's think about these three qualities uh, briefly tonight. Power, first of all. Power can be many, take many different forms from the power you, you find when you turn the light bulb on, or from the power of, a, of an engine or a machine or something like that. Um, the word here used, it doesn't mean political power. It's not the authority over people or influence or status. And it's not military might either. But this power is the ability to do something. It's having the strength, the capability, to put something into effect. And Paul used a very similar word when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ who gives me power. We're not talking here about, about our natural abilities. Some people are talented, naturally talented, naturally gifted. God will use those things, yes. But this power is not about that. It's not about our intellect about our own resources, but this is supernatural power. This is God-given ability to go beyond our natural limitations so that we can do the good works God prepared in advance for us to do. Does this power have any limits? Well, no, only if God himself has got limits. We know that God has got no limits whatsoever. It's God's power working in us so we can go beyond our natural means, do the things, say the things, act the way that we could not do ourselves. God's Spirit working in us in power. But also we have here love. He is a spirit of love. And the word here for love is a word you may have heard of before. It's agape. Agape is a wonderful word, agape, because it's a Greek word that's only used in reference to God himself. It describes God's nature and God's love, and nobody else is love. Only Him has agape love. When we read in the Bible, God is love. He 
Jesus' blood is added. This is the Son. This is divine love. This is perfect love. When we think about love, we can relate it to our human experience. And love comes in many forms in our human experience. We've got to be very careful because God's love is on a higher level than all the human love can experience. It is of a higher quality and of a higher humanity. This love is sacrificial love. It is unconditional love. And it's also unchangeable. The love we see when Christ died on the cross for us. That's the best demonstration we have of the love of God. It's a love that we don't have in ourselves naturally. You know, as human beings, we, we do love people. We love those who love us. We love the lovable. We may love the lovely. But our lovely people in ours, and we can love them. But when it comes to loving the unloving or the unlovable, the repulsive, the appalling, then we struggle. But God in us, the love of this God by His Spirit enables us to love even those who are Agape love goes beyond the limitations of our human love. It is God's love. God has given us a spirit of power, of love, and also of self discipline. The word used here, the Greek word, it, it is translated as save it, it saves the mind. It's, it's the love which, sorry, the, the discipline which stops us from making a bad decision and doing something we shouldn't do or we don't want to do. Self control. Now, some people think self control is boring. They think it, it holds people back from letting themselves go and enjoying themselves. That it leads to an inhibited and restricted and soulless life. They may think of it that way. But rather than be straightjacket, what self discipline does is it sets us free to be the people we want to be and be the people that we choose to be. No longer a prisoner to our natural sinful natures. No longer dominated by temptations and impulses and the weaknesses of our minds and our emotions that take over. No longer molded by the pressures and stress of life that can make us a person we don't want to be. But self-discipline gives us that control of ourselves. It gives us the freedom to be the best that we can be in any given situation. And it's a tremendous quality. So we have love, we have power, we have self-discipline. Tremendous qualities, all the work of God's Spirit in us. And if you're like me, I want to see more of those in me. And perhaps you want to see more of those in me too. But if we see those qualities at work in our lives, how does it affect our everyday living? How would it show in our daily life? What difference will it make? Well, Paul gives us some pointers here to Timothy when he carries on in verse 8. He says to Timothy, so he says, so in the light of what I've just told you about God giving you a spirit of power and love and self-discipline, as a, in, as a consequence of that, he says, do not be ashamed to testify about the Lord. The Holy Spirit's work will certainly affect our witness. Jesus promised his disciples he would give them power to be his witnesses. The power to share Jesus. Not just the power to share Jesus, not just the ability to share Jesus, but also the desire to share Jesus too. When I was a young Christian, I struggled with witnessing. I was told I must tell people about Jesus. But to be honest, I didn't want to. And it was a real battle. I thought I should say something, I've got nothing more to say. I don't really want to say anything anyway. It was, it was torturous. I was not doing what I was told to do. And I, I knew I should be saying something, but it wasn't in my heart to say it. The Holy Spirit will soften that. He gives us the ability to share Christ. He gives us the desire to share Christ. Because he will foster in us a love for God and love for people and the experience of Jesus that makes sharing very natural and very real. 
something which is not an effort, something which will happen almost without us going to say. That spirit working in us is power, is love, is self discipline, we bring out and weakness for other people. But also, God's spirit working in us will affect our fellowship with each other. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. We are all one in Christ, and that is because of the work of the Spirit. Corinthians tells us that we are all baptized by one Spirit into one body, and all be given the one Spirit to drink. The Holy Spirit will draw us together, and He will develop in us a love and concern for each other, even if it means at our own expense. For Timothy to acknowledge Paul could cost him dear, it could cost him his reputation. It may even cost him his personal safety because Paul was in prison. He was a prisoner. He was a criminal. Associating with him could be dangerous. But Paul knew that God's Spirit working in Timothy would develop a bond between them. The Holy Spirit always draws us together. He develops love for each other. He always promotes unity in the body of Christ. His work in us will make our friendship sweeter and closer and more precious. The Holy Spirit also affects how we deal with suffering. Paul continues, he says, But you, but, sorry, but join with me, let's get some glasses actually, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Join with me in suffering for the gospel. Unfortunately, being a Christian is never going to be the easy way. And if you ever hear that, that being a Christian is makes life easy and simple, it doesn't. It's the greatest way, but it's not the easiest way. And suffering and hardship and persecution have always been the hallmarks of the Christian life from the very beginning of the church, and they always will be. But the work of God's Spirit in us will enable us to stand through the suffering and to prevail through the difficulty and hardship. He will enable us be firm and strong, and to not be damaged by the experiences of life and crisis. The Holy Spirit affects how we deal with suffering. And the fourth area which, which Paul mentions here is the area of holiness. By the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life. How does a Christian live a holy life in a world like the one we live in today? Quick answer is with difficulty. But that, that's not God's answer. God has got an answer to that question. And the answer is by the continual help of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul writes, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. You see, the Holy Spirit working in us we're developing us a holy life. If we had to make ourselves holy, then our lives would be a misery. There would be one failure after another. Very, very frustrating. We must let God do his work in us. He will make us holy. His Holy Spirit will make us holy too. God is far better at being holy than we are. We must let him do his work. Yes, we'll take his power. And it will take his love and it will take his self discipline in us to fulfill that. But the potential to be holy in God is there. It's within our grasp because God's Spirit lives within. That's just four areas that Paul mentions to Timothy. And it affects, actually, the Holy Spirit affects every area of our lives. But that was just four, four areas that, that he mentions in particular there. But Paul was expecting to see evidence of God's Spirit. He's looking for the evidence, looking for the signs. And we also should expect to see evidence of God's Spirit working in us. The question we must ask ourselves is, is God's Spirit working in my life? Is he working in us? Is he changing us? Now, it's true to say that often change is gradual and not always dynamic. So we don't always notice it ourselves. But sometimes other people see it before us. If you see a change in a person,
Jesus and the real Christian. And you see God changing them. And why not him? Why not encourage them to let them know that God is at work? To let them know, yes, you, you have changed. You're, you're, you're more patient than you used to be. You're a different person. You don't react the way you did. Or it's different areas of life. If you see the changes where God is working, encourage your children. We are often the last person to see the changes. It might be you're thinking, well, how did I manage to get through that situation? But be encouraged because God still has been working with you. He has enabled you to deal with something right now. We may think, what made you think of that? Perhaps it's not possible. Or we may say to ourselves, how come I didn't react in a bad way when they said that to me? God's spirit is working with us. Or we may say something like, um, why did I say what I did? What made me think of those words? And how can I say them at that time? God's spirit working in us. Be encouraged by those. They seem small, they seem trivial. It's evidence that God is changing us by his spirit. It's a wonderful thought that God lives in us by his spirit. It should encourage us in the spirit of the power of love. But we've got to ask ourselves another question before we close, and that is, what can I do to help this process of change in me? It may sometimes seem very slow. It may sometimes feel as if we're, we're going backwards. What can I do about it? Do I just sit and wait for God to do it? Or am I involved? Yes, we are very much involved. I'd like us to just leave ourselves with the verse, verse 6. Paul says to Timothy, he says to Timothy, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now I don't know what the gift of God was that Paul was referring to. It might have been a particular spiritual gift. It may have been a ministry. It may have been the Holy Spirit himself. But what Paul is saying to Timothy is, fan into flame what God has already given. If God has given you, then stir it up, the author of this motion says. The Greek word is, it means, make the fire alive again. Make the fire alive again. But anybody here has got an open fire, but of course some people may not, I don't know. Um, when I was a kid, everybody had open fires, you know, cold fires, wood burning fires. We're coming back into fashion a little bit now. But an open fire is all very nice, it's all nice and cosy. Um, but in fact, they're very hard work to keep going. Fires are, are living things because they, they're always changing, they're unpredictable. A roaring fire one minute may die down to nothing, but a natural fog for an hour. A fire needs to be fed and nurtured for it to be a healthy fire. If you neglect it, if we're complacent, then it can fizzle out into just a few hours of bottom. Our relationship with God is a living thing. It's dynamic. It is always changing. The blessings of yesterday were great for yesterday, but our walk with God now, at this moment in time, is what really matters. We have to be very careful that we don't let the fire die. We need to nurture our relationship with God. We need to feed our relationship with God with good spiritual food. We need to make sure we're close with Him. In close walk with our God. Now, I do believe that a close relationship with Jesus and being filled with the Spirit go hand in hand. I don't believe you can have one without the other. It's about our closeness to Him, our intimacy with Him. How are we tonight with our God? Is the fire still burning? Have we still got a hunger and a thirst for Him? Or are the embers dying down? Are the flames going out? Are those hot coals cooling off? Are we neglecting our relationship with God? Are we becoming complacent? Many years ago, I read a book by a man called A.W. Tozer, a great Christian writer of the 20th century. I'm not quite sure when he died, probably in the 60s or 70s, something like that. But he said in one of his books something like this that we're only as far on with God as we've chosen to be. And we have a truth in that. 
You may see people who have that person there and they're so godly, they're so close to the Lord, but they have such a tremendous relationship with him and it grows from them and they'll be radiant and they'll show us like that. Well, we can. They are where they are because they've chosen to be so. They have desired the Lord and he has not disappointed them. And all that God has got for us is there. The potential is within. Planted in the case of Christ, the Spirit. But how much do we want what God has got for us? Two of them. Father, we really thank you, Lord, for your promises. You've not given us, Lord, a spirit of timidity. A spirit of fear that destroys and spoils and robs us of all the blessings you have for us. Thank you. We don't want that for us, Lord. We want the best, Lord. You give us a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Father, we marvel at those words. And Father, we're frustrated sometimes if you don't always see that in our lives. And yet that is your will for us, Lord. That is what Christ died to give us, Lord. You came that we may have life and have it in us for us. And it costs you everything to give that to us. Father, we thank you so much for what we have in Christ. And we understand, Lord, and accept that we can barely we barely experience the blessings and the fullness of what we want for each one of us. Father, we pray that you may put in our hearts a fire for you and a hunger, Lord, for you, that we may see the evidence of your Spirit more fully and more frequently in our lives day by day, in the everyday things of life, Lord, in conversations with friends, dealing with a problem at home, Sorting things out at work, doing something which we don't want to do. Lord, in simple things of life, may the evidence of your spirit be seen. That, Lord, we may see more of the, the character of Christ being revealed through us. Father, we thank you so much for what you've given us. Lord, may we cherish your gift of us. May we allow him to have more and more influence in our lives. And we ask you, Father, for your glory and for your honor.